We've got a lot to be thankful for and grateful for as a church, don't we? And a little proud of as well. So do this. Not only is my wife sitting on the front row, David and Sonia are sitting on the front row. Never sat on the front row when I preach. But that's, just throw that out there. And I'm going to tell you this. First person that says, why don't we just let Daniel preach all summer long? Y'all are in big trouble, okay? You're off the prayer list if that happens. Um, I met Daniel through uh, my, my son, Benjamin. They are friends down at um, college. And Daniel uh, was introduced to our church last summer. He went to Jamaica with us and... He had a breakout role in Amy's daily lessons, playing the role of Goliath um, to the young people in Jamaica. And if you get to know him, you just love him. He's just got a contagious spirit. And when it comes to getting someone to work with us for the summer, we've got the pick of the litter. I'll tell you that. We've got the best one. And you're going to just fall in love with him. He's a little nervous, and I would be too, but he doesn't need to be at all because uh, I am just proud for him to know you. And I'm proud for you to know him. He's 21 years old. He's a pastoral administration major at Welch College in Nashville. He is a uh, native of Virginia Beach, Virginia. But he lives over in this area now with his mom. and uh, So we're going to see him a lot. I believe he is. your mom's originally from the Philippines, correct? And so graduation is this week. Daniel's not graduating this week. But uh, school ends this week, and he and his mom are taking a trip to the Philippines, and then once he gets back from that, he'll be with us for the summer. He's not just going to be working with the youth, he's going to be doing everything. He's going to visit the elderly with me, he's going to preach Sunday mornings, we'll let him have some lessons, we're just going to show him what it's like to be a pastor and, and learn a lot. So I think he'll enjoy this. So Daniel Dale is going to come and bring the Word of God to him, make him feel welcome this morning. I was trying to think of how I should introduce myself. Well, Brother Lynn, he did a pretty thorough job of talking about me, I think. Um, and Morgan, his, his son's girlfriend, maybe, hopefully, uh, daughter-in-law, she was, she was saying, hey, you should, you should roast Brother Lynn. You should, uh, you know, make the church laugh, talk about Brother Lynn, joke him. And I was like, I was like Brother Lynn better watch out. He has one coming for him. And so, uh, but no, yes, I'm from Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm 21 years old. Pastoral ministry major, I gotta, I gotta repeat that, and uh, I'm just so glad to be here. Um, you know, I could take this internship as just a credit hour. This is something that I have to do for for my college degree, but it's more than just that. It's it's being with a people, a group of people to worship God for a summer. My goal is to learn, learn how to be a pastor, but to worship with you, and that's what's most important to glorify God. And so I'm excited to be with Brother Lynn this summer. Hopefully I'll learn something from him. I don't know. You guys know how he preaches. You guys know Brother Lynn. Maybe I'll learn something. Maybe I won't. I think I will. <laughs> I think I will. I think I will. But uh, the passage that I'll be in is Philippians chapter 1. And the main section of verses is uh, verses 19 through 26. 19 through 26. And so I guess I would talk about myself uh, more since this is my first time being here, but I won't do that. I won't. Uh, what we'll do is we'll get into into the passage. But what I do want to do to start off as an introduction is to tell you probably my fa my most favorite story in the whole entire world. The main character in this story is a very young, it's a very beautiful young lady, and she's not necessarily from the states. But she's from another country, uh, across the Pacific Ocean, from an island, uh, from an island across the Pacific Ocean. And uh, growing up, she always didn't have it easy. Um, she was the oldest of her four, her three other uh, siblings. And to describe what this lady looked like to you, uh, take the color of my skin, but probably a little bit darker, uh, the color of my hair, uh, but a little bit longer. Well, actually, a lot longer. But she's very beautiful. She's very uh, she's very pretty. Um, but in order to take, help her parents take care of her family, um, she would do things such as go to the water well. She would carry two buckets with her, with her other brother, 
And they would go to the well, the public well, draw water, bring it back. That was a daily thing. Multiple times stuff like this happens. Um, also, uh, in this particular country, her father was a rice farmer. And so if, I don't know what you all, I don't know if you all know what a rice field looks like, but take any open field here in Tennessee, flood it with water, and you see grasses of rice or I guess stalks of rice, you know, just sprouting out of the water. Um, that's what a rice field would look like. And so in the water, there were snakes, there were leeches. There were things that I guess you can say a girl would not want to deal with. Well, this is what this, this young, beautiful lady had to deal with growing up in order to take care of her family, help her father raise money by picking rice, selling it, but also providing her family with food. But also, when she got older, she realized that her father's farm and the income coming from it, it wasn't enough for the family. So what she did was she moved away. She moved to Manila uh, she moved in the Philippines, and she moved there, and she went to school there. Um, she began sewing school, and to this day, she's a pretty good, uh, pretty good seamstress. Um, she gained skills and knowledge of, of sewing there. And so after she graduated from school, she started working, and she started sending money straight back to her parents, uh, just so that her younger siblings can go to school. But then to move on from there, you are looked at as successful in this country, in the Philippines, if, if you move away, if you move abroad. And so where this one lady moved to, um, it was to Bahrain, which is in the Middle East. North of Bahrain uh, is Iraq and Afghanistan and Iran. And what she did there is she was a seamstress there. Um, what's really cool there is she became pretty popular there too. Uh, she made dresses and skirts and clothing for the royalty in Bahrain. Um, and she made friends there who helped take care of her. But any good story involves a love story. You've got to have some romance in there. And so there's this one guy, pretty buff, pretty big, pretty cool. Uh, he's a military guy. He was a CB in the Navy, and he was stationed in Bahrain during the Persian Gulf War. And as he was working there in the city, he set his eyes on this very young, beautiful woman who's talented. He got to know her. Uh, this lady, she told me that uh, during the time there, he would try to impress her by getting her flowers or chocolates, but it didn't work at first. But finally she said that she felt bad for him, so she gave him the time of day, and she would go on a date with him and hang out with him. Well, he fell in love with her, and she fell in love with him. So she fell in love with him enough to follow him back to the United States. Um, and there they got married. There they had two kids. Um, but also with stories, there's ups and downs, there's roller coasters. And so this, this young man who fell in love with this young lady, he didn't love her anymore. Um, this beautiful young lady that he said that he loved so much, he lost it. And he fell in love with another young lady. And so this beautiful, beautiful young lady from the Philippines, from another country, had her heart broken. She was devastated. She was left with two young boys, honestly asking the question, why is this happening to me? What am I to do now? Well, she couldn't just sit there and, and not do anything. She's in the United States. She was the only one from her family there in the United States, and she's just there with these two boys. And so what she did was she went to the commissary on the military base. And she started cutting meat, and she started serving it to restaurants and delivering it to restaurants. And, but it was tough. It was tough taking care of these two boys. She didn't really know the English language very well. Uh, she didn't have a license. She didn't have uh, the greatest job. But luckily, uh, through the military, the military was taking care of her, providing her funds, but she still needed to work because the funds weren't enough. And so growing up, these two little boys, they're, they're rascals. They're, they're crazy. They run all over the place. And uh, to share with you one story is in order to take care of these, these two young boys, this lady would, of course, not having a car yet, uh, she would hop on the, the public bus and uh, she would bring one-year-old in, in her arms, and this three-year-old boy is running around being all crazy, acting nuts. And uh, she'd go to the store, get groceries, arm full of groceries, another baby in her arm, and a three-year-old running around the bus, yelling at people, laughing at people. And that was just a constant thing. Sometimes she'd have to do that in the rain. But as these boys got older, as time went on, luckily, other people from her country, from the Philippines, uh, they lived in this specific area. So she became, she became really close with these people. They taught her how to drive. They helped her get a license. They taught her the English language. Uh, now, if you heard her speak, you'd, 
you probably wouldn't be able to pick up on some English words, but I can understand her pretty well. Um, and so growing up, it was tough. She would work a full-time job, a part-time job. Well, when the youngest was about two years old and the, and the oldest of the two was four years old, there's a, a lady named uh, Polly Boykin who invited this lady to go to a Baptist church uh, where they were at. Now, this lady wanted to, to uh, wanted her boys to grow up in, with a good, godly background, and so that was just the extent of it. The main religious background or the, uh, the main religion in her, in her home country is Catholicism. And so they would just go to a Catholic church. But of course, of course, having boys, they're going to be reckless. They're going to be crazy. And of course, in a, in a Catholic church, it's very quiet. It's very worshipful. And so, but yet you have these two boys yelling, screaming, crawling under the pews, running up to the, to the priest at the front, picking up money in the offering bucket and dropping it and making a lot of noise. Well, of course, this meek, quiet, gentle young lady, uh, she was embarrassed. Well, like I said, Polly Boykin invited this lady and her two boys to, to go to a Baptist church there where they were at. And there she first heard the gospel. There she heard about Christ and his sacrifice for her and how he died on the cross for the whole world, providing redemption and salvation for the entire world if they believe in him, if they place their faith in him. But also there at the church, there was a nursery so she could pay attention, not worry about the boys, so that she can hear the gospel uh, boldly preached. Um, and to continue telling the story just quickly, uh, these boys grew up going to a public school. Then all of a sudden, one day, uh, the pastor of that church where they were at and also his brother, who was an associate of that church, said, hey, put these boys in a Christian school. And it costed money, which made my mom doubt or decide, or made it a hard decision for her to put the boys there in that Christian school, but she did. And so these boys are pretty committed. At first, they were just skater boys who liked their hair to be long. Uh, they were crazy. They were the reckless crowd in public school. And probably that was the, that was the deciding factor for her to put them in, in a Christian school because they weren't hanging out with the right crowd. And so they went to Christian school. Uh, they graduated. And to tell you where the oldest one's at, he's actually serving the Lord as a youth minister here in Tennessee. And the second one, uh, he's going to Bible college there in Nashville, Tennessee. And he met some rascal named uh, Ben Scott. Uh, when he first met Ben, uh, he was pretty, uh, I don't know, at first I was like, man, this guy's kind of cocky. He thinks he knows what he's talking about. But instead of roasting Brother Len, I figured I'd roast one of my best friends instead. No, but... That's the story of me and my brother and my mom. And, and that's my favorite story in the whole world to see how the Lord has used so many different things, though it was good, though it was bad, to bring us all to the point to where we're all believers now. We all know the Lord as our personal, personal Savior. And her two boys are serving the Lord or trying to serve the Lord. I'm, trying to get better at preaching, trying to learn about ministry, and one's doing a pretty good job. Uh, he's doing all right there as a youth pastor uh, in Jolton, Tennessee. But what's interesting to see is, is my mom's response to the difficulty of trying to take care of a three-year-old and a one-year-old by herself, far away from her home country, not being in the most comfortable situation, not having it easy. She responded to divorce. She responded to not knowing the language, uh, with optimism. She couldn't give up. She had love for a three-year-old and a one-year-old, and she saw that she had to take care of them. And so she had hope that there was something greater than her. And that's why, she, that's why they went to a Catholic church. But she ultimately found it at Gateway for Baptist Church, which is my home church, and that's where she heard the gospel. But we kind of see the same thing here in this passage in Philippians. Here in Philippians, Paul, he is the man, pretty much. He's awesome. He's, he's an author of majority of the books of the New Testament. But in Philippians, he's in prison. He's in prison for doing exactly what God wanted him to do. He's in prison for preaching the gospel, sharing teachings and scriptures that taught that Christ is the true Lord of all, that he is the Son of God. And a lot of commentators and theologians think that he's in Rome, uh, he's in prison in Rome, but that's honestly up in the air, but that's necessarily not necessarily important here. But we know that he's in prison. 
We know that he's going through a tough time. But you see his attitude. You see his response to being in prison. You see his response to persecution. You see his response to going through a tough time. And here, let's read. Let's read in verses 19, and we'll read through 26. Paul says, yes, and I will, re- and I will rejoice. He's rejoicing over the fact that ultimately Christ is being preached. The gospel is being preached. Verse 19 says, For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that, that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Verse 21 says, For me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. If you would, bow your heads, and we'll pray one more time, and then we'll get into the text. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for giving me this opportunity, the opportunity to be with this church this summer, but most importantly right now is to preach to them, to share the gospel with them, to, to talk about you, and to share life that is found in you. Lord, I thank you for Paul and his life and his example and the things that we can learn from him. And I pray that as we leave today, uh, I pray that ultimately what can be said about this service is it's not about what the intern can do or it's not about maybe how beautiful the music was, but ultimately that you were honored, that you were magnified and glorified. Again, we thank you so much for your mercy, for your grace, and for your sacrifice. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So first of all, we see that Paul, he responds in a good way. He has a good attitude about being in prison. Ultimately, it's because he's in prison for doing exactly what God has called him to do. And that's to preach the gospel. That's to proclaim proclaim Christ. But we see in the first couple verses that what brings him through this, that what brings him through this difficulty, what helps him have this attitude is the prayers of the Philippian church, of the believers there in Philippi, but also it's the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's because of those things that he was encouraged, and it's because of those things that he knew that one day he was going to be delivered. And whether he wasn't delivered and whether he was going to be executed there in Philippi, that was okay because he knew Christ as his Savior, and his ultimate destination was heaven. So either he was going to be delivered from prison or he would be delivered to heaven one day. But we also see that this encouragement challenges him to not be ashamed, but also it challenges him to honor honor and glorify Christ in his body. He says, by life or by death, whether it's I'm living here on this earth and I know my goal, which is to preach Christ, proclaim the gospel, or whether I die because I preach preach Christ and preach the gospel, that's okay. That's okay because my life is his. And because he gave his life for mine. And then we see a verse that I think a majority of believers know, if not, which is a very powerful verse. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And I think today that that is a very countercultural, countercultural fra- two set of phrases right there. That to live is Christ and to die is gain. For today, I think a lot of people would say, The world would say, and maybe some Christians would say, to live is gain. And then some Christians would say, to die is Christ. But instead, Paul reverses that. Instead, he says, to live is Christ. With whatever I'm doing here on earth, when I live, when I preach, my going on missionary journeys, my preaching to you, teaching you the scriptures, it's Christ. It's to honor and glorify him and him alone. But he says, to die is gain. If he was to die, he would only be closer to Christ. He would be in the presence of the Lord. He would have a more intimate relationship with him. But truly you see what you see Paul's heart here in in this passage as we continue to read on. 
Verse 22 says, if I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Paul, in his preaching so far, he was able to plant a lot of churches in different places as he went on these missionary journeys. A lot of people came to the faith because of Paul's preaching, of Paul's ministering. And so he says, if I'm going to live, then that means there are more people, hopefully, they are going to be saved. If I'm to preach the gospel, more people are going to be saved. It's only more fruit for the kingdom. And he says, yet which I shall choose, I can't tell. He's trying to decide whether or not, you know, hey, I'm in prison. I'm having a good attitude about this. The gospel's being preached. So if I died right now, it'd be okay. It'd be wonderful. I'd be in heaven with God. I'd be in the presence of Christ. So he says, it's, it's hard. I want to be with you guys, but yet I could be with Christ in heaven. He says, yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My, my desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. He saw that there was a mission still to be fulfilled. He knew that there was a lot more souls that needed to be saved. He knew that there's a lot more people that haven't heard of the gospel. And that's why he says, it's more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, I will stay here on earth and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. If anything, Paul was a great encourager. He was a stronghold of these people's lives. Every time he came and visited, it was almost like, I don't know, say, seeing the President of the United States walk in. You'd be excited but in a more personal and intimate and closer kind of way. So I guess you'd say, I don't, I don't know if you'd say this, but if Brother Len left for a while, and if you went on a trip, traveled for a few weeks, and then you had someone fill in that doesn't do a good job as Brother Len at preaching, but he's still yet preaching the gospel, he's doing a good job at taking care of you guys, and then Brother Len comes back, you're like, yes, Brother Len's back. He's awesome. He's going to do a great job at preaching the gospel. That's what Paul was to these people. Paul loved these people. He took care of these people. He preached the gospel to them. And these people looked forward to Paul's coming back again. And so that was just uh, a few words to describe what's going on here in this text. But what are some things that we can take away from this text this morning? And I want to share with you, first of all, it's that we need each other. We need each other's prayers. We need love and encouragement from each other. And I honestly believe that if it wasn't for the prayers of the believers there in Philippi, that Paul probably would be very discouraged if he knew that the people there weren't thinking about him, praying about him, loving on him, looking forward to his returning back, that he'd just be very discouraged in prison. But also, we need the Holy Spirit. We need the Lord. We need his presence. We need to depend on him. We need to pray to him. We need to trust in him. I want to ask you today, I know that we live in a very broken, wicked, and evil world. And it's okay to come to church, going through difficulty, going through the struggle of life every day. It's okay to bring your problems and your troubles, and maybe whatever you're going through, maybe you're struggling through a certain sin, this sin has a bind on your life, and you can't get freed from it. It's okay to bring that to church. And I want to share with you that it's okay to rely on others. It's okay to pray for others, but it's okay to say, hey, I need prayer. I'm going through this. And in a sense that you're in a prison of whatever it may be, whether it's the struggle of, I just lost my job. My mom's case, her husband that she loved divorced her, and she had two two young boys to take care of. Whatever you're going through, I want to share with you that we need each other, depend on each other, but depend on the Lord. But also, we need to do everything we can to honor and glorify Christ. To live is Christ and to die is gain. To live is not gain and then to die is Christ, but to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's what Paul told the Philippians. That was what his mindset was. As he lived here on earth, it was to honor and glorify Christ in him alone. And if he were to die, it's okay okay because he was going to be with Christ. But to live is Christ, to die is gain. And honestly, as, 
as an intern here this summer, that's my goal here, to, to prove to you that that is, that is my banner that hangs over my head, that Christ is all I live for. He is who I live for. I'm, I'm at school, and, and hopefully this summer I'll get the experience to become better at preaching. But hopefully in the future, as I become a minister, maybe a youth pastor, an associate pastor, I want to show to the people that to live is Christ, to die is gain. I want to show these kids here as I'll be teaching them in other Sunday school classes that to live is Christ and to die is gain. And then lastly, our lives are for the purpose of glorifying God and living for others. Our lives are for the purpose of glorifying God and living for others. That's exactly what characterized Paul's life here. He was going through a tough time. He was in prison for preaching the gospel, for doing exactly what he wanted, what he was called to do. But he wasn't focused on himself. But what, what he was focused on was this situation is nothing, will bring nothing but glory to God. And if, I, if I'm released, I'm just going to come back to you and minister to you and share with you the gospel. And so I want to share with you today, I want to ask you a few questions. Are you here today? Are you broken? Maybe because of what happened in the week. Maybe because of something that happened in the past that you're still trying to overcome. I want to share with you that we need each other. We need the prayers of the church. That we need the Holy Spirit. We need the Lord and His help. I want to share with you that it's okay to rely on others. Also, are you depending on the Holy Spirit and the Lord? Are you trusting in Him that He'll bring you through? For we serve an awesome we serve a very powerful God that can bring you through anything. Are you depending on Him? We need to do everything we can to honor and glorify Christ. And our lives are the, for the purpose of glorifying God and for living for others. Are you living for others today? And in your life, can you honestly say that you are bringing honor and glory to Christ? And so honestly, I don't know how long Brother Lund preaches. And I really didn't want to go too long because we got lunch coming up. But I want to share with you, thank you so much for, for having me here today, uh, this summer. I'm looking forward to learning a lot. I'm looking forward to knowing each and every single one of you, getting to know each and every single one of you. But I want to share with you that in everything we do, make sure we do it for the honor and glorify Christ. We need others. We need the prayers of others. We need the Holy Spirit. We need his help. We need to glorify him in what we do. If you would, bow your heads with me, heads with me, and close your eyes. Close the service in prayer, and I'll, I'll turn it over to Brother Lynn. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your mercy and grace and your love. We thank you so much for uh, the youth and how they've done an awesome job in leading us in worship. And, and we see that it's so encouraging that there are young people that are giving their lives over to Christ at an earlier age that are wanting to live for you at an earlier age. I pray that they wouldn't give up. But, dear Lord, if there's one thing that we can take away from this message, I pray that it would be everything we do in our lives, as we live our lives, it's to live for you. And if we die, that's okay, because it's gain, because we'll be in your presence. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that ultimately you are honored and you are glorified. As we leave today, I pray that you'll keep us safe. Guide us and protect us, and I pray that we would only glorify you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Young people, come on up. Children's Church is coming up. We're going to sing a song in conclusion. Michael, I don't know if they told you to put this in there, so I'm going to make you, are, do you have it in there? Amazing love, how can it be? So we're going to sing this together. And you can get some on this side. Doesn't the stage look good? Doesn't it look good? Let's stand together. Let's stand. Well, they're still coming, so come on, y'all.
We'll sing this song after it's over. We'll consider that the benediction on the service. Daniel and I will be in the back, front. We'll be that way. I never do know what to call that, but we'll be back there. And aren't you excited about the possibility of having him here this summer? Isn't that going to be great, what God does for us? So, this looks good to see. Thank the Lord for what's on this stage right now. Let's sing this song together. Amazing love, how can it be?